Hey what's up everybody, Trophynet here and welcome back to Gwent Edge. In this show we talk about specific Gwent cards or interesting decks to play around with. Today we will be discussing the Crime Lord deck, a mixed bag of syndicate abilities that work surprisingly well together. The main focus of this deck is using crime cards in combination with the lined pockets leader ability to quickly gain a lot of coins, which you can then spend in big bursts with one of the heavy hitting cards included in this deck. To round out the deck we also included some smaller spender cards and a poison package. That's the general description, but you're here for the details, of course. Before we dive any deeper, you can check out the deck composition on screen right now, and you can also find this deck and the guide on the Play Gwent website. The link is down here in the description. With that said, let's go over the different cards and how to use them. Let's start with Lined Pockets, our leader ability. It automatically gives you an extra coin whenever you play a crime card and you have 5 extra coins you can add to your bag whenever you want in any way you want to use them. This gives you a lot of flexibility on how you use your other cards. If you're for example one coin shy of using Savola, you can add that card to give you access to his ability in one go. Because of the extra coins you get on playing crime cards, Line Pockets is also the perfect catalyst to gain coins fast. There are 7 crime cards in this deck with the option to play an 8 one true Trisk Telekinesis, who allows you to play a copy of a Bronze special card from either player's starting deck. Congregation is usually my go-to opener, playing 3 Fire Sworn Zealots instead of 2, since I will not have any coins just yet. The other crime cards are all offensive. Bloody Good Fun gives you 4 coins and then spends all of your coins and turns them into one big damage hit on a target of your choice. Important to note here is that this will not include the extra coin you get from lined pockets, so you'll have one coin left after using this card. Dip in the Pontar allows you to damage an enemy unit by 3 and gives you 3 coins on top of that, which of course results in 4 coins with lined pockets. Tavern Brawl forces two adjacent enemy units to duel one another, and this in particular can result in a lot of value, but requires a bit of math to figure out the best targets. You should be looking for two units where one is slightly over half of the power of the other one. 7 and 11 for example, 5 and 8, stuff like that. Even a unit of 3 power and one of 5 next to that will give you 7 damage in total. Just remember to select the lowest unit first and then the highest unit to maximize the damage going back and forth between your first target and your second target. I like Tavern Brawl over Gord here because of the extra removal. It's also slightly more consistent value wise since you could be underperforming with Gord if you're in bad luck. The final crime card, Fistek, has multiple uses. It allows you to poison a unit which combined with the other poison cards in this deck the Fistag Trafficker and the Mutated Hounds can be used to take out high power units or important engine cards. There's enough poison in this deck to do this twice in each game. But on top of that, Fistag also gives you 4 coins, 5 with lined pockets, which almost instantly fills up your bag. This is a great way to quickly enable you to use your stronger cards, all of which require a high coin count. Furco the Sculptor functions as a tech option, allowing you to pull any crime card from your deck and play it immediately. I usually pull Tavern Brawl with Furco, but you can use him to pull an extra fist deck if you need it for example, or Bloody Good Fun if you need a quick way to spend all your coins. Having Furco in hand also widens your mulligan options, since you can mulligan crime cards away knowing that you can pull them back if you need to. A few of the cards in this deck also directly benefit from playing crime cards, mainly because of Intimidate, which boosts a unit whenever you play a crime. The most important card to talk about here is Horson Senior. Despite being a horrible father, Senior is a great card to start a round with. Play Congregation first to get a few Firesworn on the field and then transform them into cut-ups using Horson Senior. As long as all three of these units live, so the two Cullops and Horson Senior, you'll get 5 extra points for every crime card you play. 1 point from the Intimidate on Horson Senior himself, and 2 random damage from each of the Cut-ups every time you play a crime card. 
This can be incredibly oppressive in the first round for your opponent, and if you go first, you don't even need to use any of your lined pockets charges to fund the tribute. You can get enough coins from the Tiger's Eye stratagem. Madame Louisa is our other interesting Intimidate card. If her order ability is triggered, the next tribute card you play during that round will automatically trigger its tribute ability without the need for any coins. This means that you can play her early in the round to trigger the tribute ability on the very last unit you play, which generates some insane hidden value that your opponent might have forgotten about. You can protect Louisa with Azar Javed as well, to ensure you'll be able to trigger her ability without too much trouble. Which brings us right to our heavy hitters. There's two cards you'll want to use Louisa on. Savola or Tin Boy. Savola is pretty straightforward. He gives you two coins, but has a tribute of nine to spawn his Frightener, an 11 power monstrosity with six armor. With Louisa, this constitutes a 19 point play, since you'll have his two coins to spend on something else as well. Tin Boy is a bit more complicated. His base ability allows you to deal two damage to all units on a specific row, so basically lacerate. But if you pay 8 coins, he deals 2 damage to all enemy units on the board. It's a pretty hefty cost, since most of the time you won't be facing an enemy board that has more than 4 units on each row. If that is not the case, you can better spend your 8 coins on something else. With Louisa, you don't have that dilemma however. Tin Boy will damage everything regardless, free of charge. But keep in mind that if you won't do 8 damage on that other row, the row you wouldn't be selecting if you only could target one row, paying the tribute might not be worth it. Our last big whammy is Philippa Eilhard. You can't use Louisa on her, but her ability allows you to choose an enemy unit and if you can match its power with the coins in your bag, you can pay that amount to seize that card, basically doubling the value of the coins you spend. This is especially powerful in this deck, since you can gain coins so quickly and snatch an early engine card from your opponent. That's an overview of the stronger cards in this deck, but the most important thing to keep in mind when playing this deck is to keep a spender in your hand at all times, especially in the final round. You do not want to end the game with 8 or more coins in your bag and no way to spend them. Street Urchins are not only perfect to spend your final coins, they also give you 3 coins when you play them, which makes them ideal to play in a pass round so you have some coins when you start the next round. The Eternal Fire Disciple can spawn some more Firesworn Zealots for 2 coins each, the Coerced Blacksmith can spend all of your coins on boosting other units, and last but not least, Ewald or Sodi can burst damage on multiple enemies, which could very well take out multiple greatswords or dryads for example. Even bloody good fun can be used to spend your final coins in a useful way, in case you don't have any of the other options. But as we've been doing in the past few videos, let's take a look at an example match to see how all of this fits together. Because Syndicate decks especially are always a challenge to navigate because of the coin mechanic, so I'm hoping this overview can help you improve on when to use your coins and when to store them, when to use certain abilities and when to hold off on doing something. It will still involve a lot of basic math, but with the timer ticking down some easy ways to remember certain combos will definitely help in making quick decisions in later matches. In this match we face off against a Northern Realms deck, and I'm gonna spoil things a little bit. It's a siege deck, which means very very high damage output and lots of ways to take out my units. As my first play, I always try to use Horse and Senior. He gives you a very solid base to work from if you have some crime cards in your hand. Usually you have Congregation to get him going, but we'll try to use the Eternal Fire Disciple here instead. Bloody good fun is only useful in certain situations since it drains all your coins, so that one gets mulliganed and I also try to limit myself to only one bronze spender per round so the urchins can go for now as well. Things start off slow. I set up with a fire sworn, my opponent with a Redanian knight and a trebuchet. To generate some coins, I hit the trebuchet with the dip in the pontar. Since Horse and Senior transforms units and resets them to 4 power, I can handle the damage from the trebuchet and I generate another zealot to ensure I have two targets in the next turn. Horson then turns both the damaged zealot and the new one into cutups, which concludes our basic setup. 
Our opponent, sadly for us, sadly for us, recognizes the threat and takes out one of the cut-ups with Prince Anseis, cutting down our crime gains from 5 points to 2. Now, I don't intend to win this round anymore, which means that I turn my attention to setting up for the next rounds. Syndicate can do this better than any faction by storing coins. That's where Fistek comes in. I target the Redanian Knight since it has the highest body and will keep generating points and poison him twice by playing another Fistek with Triss. Important here is that I avoid losing coins by spending some with the Disciple to generate another Zealot, so we don't hit the coin cap on the second Fistek. Keep an eye on that coin counter if you uh, want to make this work. This brings us to 8 coins, 4 of which will carry over to the next round, so that sounds very very nice. I try one more time to gain the upper hand with Kurt, but the amount of vitality on the field became overwhelming, so I don't risk pushing this any further. I've seen enough to realize what is coming. In the next mulligan round, the Hounds are useless on their own, so we swap them for the Urchins, and I also swapped Tavern Brawl since I can pull it with Furco the Sculptor, which is already in our hand. We need to be careful, however, since we have both Philippa and Savola in our hand already. We need to be able to generate enough coins for both of those abilities in the final round. Our opponent passes in round 2, so we can play the Urchins to maximize our coins in the final round without overplaying. With 7 coins, we keep 3 in the final round. In the final mulligan phase, we get rid of our extra spenders and bronzes, since we have Ewald to spend coins and get Heatwave and our Fistag Trafficker in return. Now things get serious. We play as our Java to provide some extra protection, hopefully to use him on uh, to protect Luisa further on, but both bugs get immediately taken out by Falibor. The big cards are clearly coming out. Northern Realms usually doesn't have poison cards, and since we aren't sure we'll be able to poison a unit twice, we use the Trafficker on Javed instead to gain us 3 coins and start setting us up a little bit. Our opponent's first siege engine, the Carabalista, is promptly seized by Philippa, our Philippa, so we can use the 2 damage instead of our opponent. We'll need it later on to thin out the siege engines, which are definitely coming. Mata comes in next, giving us another Congregation card and probably the Siege card for our opponent. Northern Realms usually lack stall removal, so I take a risk and use Madame Louisa next, in the hopes of getting a free Tribute ability later on. Our opponent reacts with the full Siege play, so kind of overreacting there, but two trebuchets and a battering ram are added to the field. Very impressive, but not enough to take out Louisa we have our free tribute available, so keep that in mind. The siege engines are the biggest threat here. We need to take them out as quickly as possible, so we take out the highest trebuchet with Karate Heatwave and damage the other one with our Caraballista. Our opponent plays another Caraballista in return, which triggers the bombardment, the final stage of siege, severely crippling our side of the board. The worst is over for now, so we need to start counting. Furco provides us with a lot of options, but we need to focus on taking out the siege engines for now. So, with one coin in the bag, we play bloody good fun to deal 5 damage in total to that new Carnivalista, negating the 2 damage it could have done and taking it out, leaving us with another coin. In the meantime, the siege engines keep rolling in, and since I'm afraid of another bombardment, I decide to play Savola and the Free Tribute, providing us with that beefy Frightener, which could provide some protection against random damage, because of its armor. We have 3 cards left, so coin management is very, very crucial now. We're aiming to trigger Tin Boy's full ability, so we need 8 coins. We have 3 in the bag, and 4 more from our leading ability, which brings us to 7. We get another one when we play Congregation, so that brings us to 8, the 8 we need for Tin Boy, so Ewald can use his 2 coins to deal 2 damage, which we use to take out the final trebuchet. Our opponent starts playing Caravan Vanguards, which plays right into our hand. The more targets we have, the better for Tin Boy. Ewald gets taken out by Boiling Oil, and our Congregation card gives us the final coin we need. Another Caravan Vanguard provides us with 2 more targets, which allows Tin Boy to hit for a whopping 16 damage, a 20 point play in total which is barely, but just barely enough to win us the game. It was a very, very close, since our opponent's Bloody Baron 
can find a valuable enough target to reset. So again, kind of a benefit of this deck. It was, again, very, very close, but this deck was able to defeat one of the stronger meta decks with some quick thinking. To wrap this up, um, during testing I won most of my matches with this deck. I managed to go from rank 6 to almost rank 4 with this deck. And the hardest decks to play against with this deck are Nilfgaard Soldiers, because uh, Double Ball you can easily counter with the Heat Wave and you're not as susceptible to poison, but the Soldiers are better protected. Um, Squirtle Harmony decks are also a bitch to fight against, um, or even Elven Swarm decks in case you don't have Tin Boy in your hand, but that's then a prerequisite of that. You should be able to handle anything else quite nicely. Again, you're not as susceptible to poison since you rarely have high bodies on the field, and you can store your points for whenever you need them. There are also very few engine cards in this deck, so locking is also not as effective as you might think, and you have one Purify in Kurt in case you do need it. Again, the most important thing to keep in mind is your coin count and how many coins you need to play the cards you want. Keep an eye on that and keep a spender in hand and you should be able to handle most situations and come out on top. And that's it for today. What do you think about the Crime Lord deck? Got any other ideas on how to improve it or any new ways to outthink your opponent? Don't hesitate to leave advice in the comment section down below so we can help each other out. That's what we're here for after all. If you're aching for more, I have recent videos on a Squiretel movement deck, a Northern Realms Mages deck or a very hard hitting Skellig deck you can check out. And if you're looking for something a little bit different, you can check out my art secret videos in Gwent or any of my broader analysis videos. We also recently, last week, they took a look at the uh, new abilities coming in the Master Mirror expansion and I'm really looking forward to the uh, new evolving cards. I was kind of wrong with my guess for Syndicate. That ended up being Jacques de Aldersburg. But uh, again, I'm really looking forward to the Skellige card on Monday, hoping to be Ceres, but I'm guessing it also might, now that I've got a bit more time to think about it, it might actually be Canby and then into, uh, well, working their way to Ragnarok. Uh, could be a very cool Skellige evolving card. But any feedback on any of my videos is greatly appreciated. Check me out on Twitter at at trophynut, that's T-R-O-V-N-U-T, if you want to talk. And if you enjoyed this video, why not give it a like? Any support is really appreciated. So again, thanks enormously for watching and hope to see you guys in the next video of Grand Edge. Goodbye. You can predict blah blah blah. I hit the trapish the trap the blah. Cutting down our crime gains from Ooh, I bit my tongue there. Blah, blah, blah. Keep an eye on that coin can blah, blah. the coin key coin coin. Coin counter, coin count, count coin, 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 count. Okay. Northern Realms usually doesn't have poison uh, push cards. The siege engine, well, god damn it, siege engines is a fucking hard word. Our opponent, don't hesitate, hesitate, hesitate.